Well, good morning, Q. How are you all doing? Been a funny week. Um, we've made it. But uh, it's been one of those weeks that I've kept saying to her, I'm not even sure we're supposed to be there on Sunday. And then apparently this morning, the words weren't working on the screen and there's been all sorts of things going, going on. And then because I haven't had much of a voice, I wasn't coming to early practice to, to sing. And then I found that I lost my whole equilibrium. I didn't know even how to get dressed because the clock had a different time on it. And I'm thinking I haven't a clue what I'm doing because I've been in such a rut for a very long time. But anyway, we're here and uh, that's great. I, uh, I thought to myself, it, it, the, the song goes, it's just another manic Monday, but I always think it's just another manic Sunday. I wish it was Monday. Anyway, it soon will be. Anyway, thanks. Thanks for being here today and all, all those who haven't managed it because of all sorts of bugs and what's going on, well, get better soon. Um, when I'm asked if I would, you know, part, participate in this, uh, what is supposed to be our last uh, in leadership in that sense, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll say something. <laughs> and then you start thinking about how do you put... 30 odd years into, <laughs> into 10 minutes. Oh my goodness, what I do. And so I think it's been the hardest prep week, uh, week of my entire life. And I say thank you for the, uh, the singing team that they've risen to the task and they've done great and I'm <laughs> thrilled. But that's the kind of stuff we're made of, isn't it? I, I believe so. And that ain't going to change for me. Anyway, I felt that last week was a good end, <laughs> and uh, I think maybe it should have been. Um, I didn't know whether I was writing my own eulogy or our eulogy, but you know, of course, when I say I, I'm really meaning Anth, because we're joined at the hip. Um, and I don't know whether today it should, we should be talking about ourselves, should we be talking about, uh, you know, something of great significance that we want to leave you with. Or, or what? Um, but, I mean, let's just see what comes out, shall we? Let's just see what comes out. I'm grateful to you all um, for coming the journey with us. What a ride. Hey, what a ride. And it's not over. It's, uh, we're just changing the, uh, the, the driver or, or the drivers or whatever. Um, it's just, it's change. And um, I want to thank everybody who's helped us on the journey. I, I start with my kids first because um, they've carried the dream for us and uh, not backed off one little bit through all the difficulties of the last 20 years particularly have been hard um, and they've not missed a beat whatever was going on. So it doesn't go without saying... And although I may miss some, some people to say thank you too, it doesn't go without saying that I'm grateful to you all. The next person I would want to say I'm grateful to is Danny, because he truly did leave his father's house. He left his father's house and he joined us and he's given us the very early best years of his life and I'm grateful for that, thank you. I'm sorry, I just need to be honest. Uh, open and uh, Dave Craven thank you for being my creative uh, partner in crime when I said to him I want you to build this he didn't say no he said well tell me what you see did he see it no but he was willing to see what I saw and that creativity I'm going to talk about that just for a few minutes and I hope I don't take too long because Anthony and others are going to uh, say things but I want it to be significant this morning but the creativity that's been brought to this place has been immense and uh, I, I, I'm thrilled that I've always had people whether it was Danny who could hear what I wanted to sing or whether it was Dave who was able to build what I wanted to build. But um, the other person I want to just say thank you to is Eunice. 
Shall I tell you why? Because when it comes down to the, um, the first one in the kitchen to put our hands in the sink, it was Eunice. And I know there's others. Please don't say I'm not picking you, but these are one, the ones on my heart. Who, it gets to 11 o'clock and quarter to 12, and Eunice has still got her hands in the sink. And it doesn't go without saying. So I'm grateful. And of course, the rest of you, that's not saying that you, the rest of you haven't done things, but there have been people who have really helped carry the load, and I'm really grateful for that. Anyway, the reason why I showed that clip at the beginning, because um, what question came to me in the week was, well, it was the thought of Jesus saying, and I don't want to quote it wrong, I probably will, but let's make it up as we go along. Um, when Jesus said, I've done all that the Father gave me to do. And I've been asking myself the question, well, have, have we done that? And I actually think I can honestly say on our behalf, we have. It may not have been understood at times, but we have been faithful to what we thought God would have us do and what we would have us become. And we've been faithful to that. So I can put a hand on heart and say, we have done what we were called to do. And the reason why I showed that clip is because it, uh, it came at a point, would you believe that was 2000, uh, that chicken run was done. And it coincided very much with where we were on our journey when there was things that we didn't understand that didn't made, make sense. We'd been in this all our lives, but there were things that weren't, weren't gelling and it wasn't right. And when this film came out, it was like all of a sudden it made sense. And all we've ever wanted for this place and for you people is that you be free range chickens. Now, I know that sounds weird, but if it helps you just keep it in your head, because whether you like it or not, we are, the, we, we are prone to going into prison. We imprison ourselves with so much. And some of you think, oh, no, no, we're not like that. Oh, yes, you are. And I'm going to be, be brave enough to say, COVID has proved it. Because when every, suddenly you're all worried, 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 worried. We're looking for something to give me certainty that says we'll be okay now. That is religion and it's just a proof that it's everywhere and we do it without thinking all the time. So what I wanted to bring this again is to say like what Paul said, he says, having been freed, now don't go back into bondage, right? Because we will. And it's easy to say, oh, you know, well, no, we've, 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 we've got out of the, the camp and we're now okay. But you see, what happens in the camp, and I was about to say this a few minutes ago. See, Danny once told me, you know, it's being a free-range free chicken isn't all it's cracked up to be. Because it might be a better roaming free for the chickens, but they're more prone to disease. They're more prone to have stuff in their system that a farmer or a, a battery farm, which I know we don't like, would be able to make sure they didn't have. Does, does that make sense? So you're not just saying, well, we, we, we go out into the free, wonderful green grass that, you know, Ginger talks about and it makes everything all right. It doesn't, you see. And there is as much to deal with in that free range area as there were in the, the camp. But the prisoner of war camp was an accurate picture of what religion can become. And we knew many years ago there was a better place. Somewhere beyond that hill, as she said, it has wide open spaces, lots of trees and grass. But then, of course, who's going to feed us? We feed ourselves. Well, where's the farm? There is no farm. Then where does the farmer live? There is no farmer, Babs. Is he on holiday? He isn't anywhere. Don't you get it? There's no morning egg count, no farmers, no dogs, and coops and keys or fences. You see, freedom has been the goal. Now, the sad thing about that, and we've talked about it before, anxiety is the dizziness 
of freedom. And some people prefer the prison camp. They have no identity without it. They can't control themselves and need someone else to control them. The, the phrase, so you want to go back to Egypt, comes to mind. So don't be fooled. The spiritual journey is no less ego-driven than anything else out there. The ego can't stand that there is nothing to strive for. Just tell it you're already what you seek. Just tell it everybody's included. Just tell it that we're all just the ocean in a drop and see how it begins to mourn its sameness. And sometimes I look at this place and I think, do you know what's happening here is that the death of the ego has come. When you kill an ego, what is there to strive for? And out there in the world, that's all you see all of the time, striving, striving, striving. And it, it creates something. And we've taken that away. And it can feel very flat. But actually, it's probably where the reality lies. Anyway, this is what I want to leave with you. I was reared for ministry. The church was all that mattered. In fact, the only thing that mattered. My parents weren't interested in education or careers. It was out of the question that I could go to art school or college. Why? Because I'd backslide. I'd go away from God. Because you start asking questions and find yourself outside the tracks that have been laid for you. A friend of mine called Chrissy Atkinson, she actually became the wardrobe uh, person for the whole show, Game of Thrones. I grew up with her and I know what I could have achieved if I'd have been released into that world. But no, I, I was uh, safe for better things, could you say? So what was wonderful though was my parents at least allowed me to bring my creative skills into the church and it gave me an outlet, which was wonderful. And uh, so what we did, you know, like I said a minute ago with Dave, we wanted to bring that into the church and I believe we've done it in a very excellent way. But why was the church so important? We've dropped a lot of the language that used to be used. But the church, and when I say church, I'm talking people, those that are in the church, was symbolic for a bride for Jesus. Jesus died for this. This was the, 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 how we were reared. And it was the love of his life. And this might help some of you understand why Anthony and I have been so committed for so long. You love and give yourself for what God loves. Besides, Jesus is coming soon. You don't give anything to this temporary world because heaven was all that mattered. But anyway, as I said, my parents were willing to let me bring some creative skills into the church, provided it served the gospel. And I wanted our church to have the best music. I wanted us to have the best cinema. I wanted us to have the best theater because the church always seemed to get the leftovers or the poor quality stuff. And that wasn't good enough for the bride of Christ. Now, we don't talk in pictures like that anymore. But if I can put that in your heart, that that's what we really ought to be serving, that, that idea, it makes you want to knuckle down and just give it the best of yourself. So anyway, I wanted to change it on every level. And uh, the church was our world. Therefore, we better have the best within it. Things have changed greatly now. And I don't want to talk about that, but we're not, we're not as, uh, if you think about it, if you could only find your husband in church and you could only, do, you know, you couldn't go to the cinema, you couldn't go to the theatre. Well, this is your world, but you see, that's not the truth anymore. We, we're, we're much more open and we're, we're, we're more able to be free in, in, in the whole thing. So it's very much has changed. But anyway, this is what I want to just leave you with. So we've contributed our verse. And it's strange as it co it's coming at a time when I couldn't be more proud of what Q has become. But unless we all go beyond what we've already mastered, we will never grow. And it's time for us, meaning Anth and I, and particularly Anth, to give ourselves permission to go beyond this. 
And I know that's hard for some people to hear. Does it mean that we'll never be around? No, it doesn't mean that. But what it means is we have to grow beyond this. But like the journey beyond Emmaus, there's no beaten out track, no street lights, no signposts, totally uncharted territory. And to boldly go into the unknown, uncertain of anything, cutting down overgrown brambles and nettles like breaking ice from week to week is exhausting. But that has been the road marked out for us and we embraced it and we've done our best to work that out. So we have worked hard to remove the religious fences that were great for business, but made the bride ugly and judgmental. I am, I am much more pride, proud of the bride than I've ever been. And I mean that with all my heart. If, you, if one complicates things enough, they will always have a job. <laughs> That's never been our hearts. There is a saying, they muddy the water to make it look deep. But Alan Watts says, muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone. And like when the curtain of the temple tore, when the dust settled, what was revealed was there was nothing there. Everything that held the people in bondage was just a lie. So what we are becoming is something of a paradox. It's the recognition we don't have to become anything. It's as simple as that. I have always been found and I am already enough. So the next chapter, if you want different then bring different. Bring your best gifts. If you want a fountain flowing with milk, and some of you are thinking, what on earth are you talking about? My dad used to tell a story, and it was about a king who, on his birthday, he said, I want a fountain flowing with milk for my birthday. And he says, tell everybody in the kingdom to bring a pint of milk, and as they come into the kingdom, pour it into the, 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 the container, and when we switch it on, we will see something Unique, because nobody's ever had a fountain flowing with milk. Story goes, what happens? Great moment, fanfares, switch it on. What comes out? Water. Why? Because everybody thought somebody else would. They'll bring it. I don't have to. Nobody will know that I just brought water. But are you following the drift? If you want something different, then bring different. Bring your best gift. And if you want a fountain flowing with milk, then you better fill it with milk and not water. Don't think someone else will do it. So finally, don't cry it's over. Smile, it happened. Well, well good morning. I think Chris said very eloquently um, a lot of the things that I would have highlighted to say thank you. And so I appreciate that greatly. Um, and also, Joel's been very generous when he says he started on the music team at 14, which he actually did. <clears throat> but he was actually performing for us and, and here from being probably five years old. We had him out singing on the streets like a little Stevie Wonder. <laughs> and uh, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, not only have our kids served us, but they're still here and and serving you, and I'm, uh, if there's one thing I'm proud about, I'm probably proud about that more than, more than anything else, that they have felt that who we were was good enough for them to want to be part of that and stay attached to that and be our supporters. So thanks, thanks to the kids particularly, and obviously Chris, you know, I mean, we've walked this journey together. Um, but I go back a lot further even than that story. Um, I will be 66 years old tomorrow, which sounds really weird when I say it. Um, but I've been in this church in its form for 60 years. I think the only person, possibly persons here, who predate me is Margaret Anderson. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what Keith, was Keith here? Yeah. Were you here as well, Keith, with your mom? Keith and Margaret are the only ones here who actually predate me. Uh, so they go back 60 plus years. So I appreciate you still here after, after all that time. That's phenomenal. It's absolutely awesome. 
And uh, yeah, so, you know, today I've been asked, well, you know, how do you feel about today? And I said, I feel absolutely fine. Uh, and if I didn't, I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So if you're expecting me to feel something else other than fine, then we, I wouldn't be doing this today. So I actually feel fine about it. I know it's right for many of the, the reasons Chris said, and he's never showed these little crazy videos from Chicken Run. Uh, you know, they express really what we've been about, what we're trying to do. Um, now, Chris also kept saying to me, you peaked last week, you should have been doing what you did last week. <laughs> and she was absolutely right. Uh, However, my issue, my issue has always been that was what I had last week. I could no more have put that away last week and brought it this week than anything else because I've always tried to be authentic to where I was and that was supposed to be last week. And yeah, in one sense, I could have rung in sick today because we've had bad colds and said, hey, pretty much said everything I wanted you to hear last week. But it also made me think if, if you went back and just listened to what I have taught for the last 12 months it would do you good. So you've got plenty to be going on. And uh, so I don't want to particularly take time to look back. Um, you know, remember we did the crudes and, and Guy and, and Grug, and uh, some of our smaller members have caught on to that and died, being the end, <laughs> being the end of the story this week. Ask, ask Kev. Um, well, I want to be like Guy, not Grug so that today is not her, and she fell and died, but she fell and she flew. So that's my desire. Now, there is a, there's an interesting verse that um, has kept cropping up in my thinking about life for many, many, many years. Let me read it to you. It's from, it's from the old book of Numbers in the Old Testament of the Bible. And it says, But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit... And follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land that he went to and his descendants will inherit it. I'm not here to preach this verse except to say that the people to whom Caleb belonged were supposed to inherit something but had got absolutely stuck walking around in circles. And it would take somebody of a different spirit to break the mold, to change the course to set the direction. And I've believed about our role within the context of Christendom, let's call it that, that it takes a different spirit to stop a group of people walking around in circles, covering lots of ground but never possessing any of it. And I believe that's been our role. But I simply wanted to raise that to say that that, that different spirit has been here. You have to continue in a different spirit if you want this to continue. Now, in terms of Issues like leadership, you know, the numbers of people who would desperately like to take over what it is we have here are plenty. They are, as we would say, two a penny, or as the Americans would say, a dime a dozen. But do you know what would happen? They'd take it back to common narrative. They'd take it back to all the things that we've tried to free it from. And so we found our pool of opportunity very small. And so this morning, this is going to be finished off by Jenny. Because Jenny has very honestly and faithfully stepped up to stand in the gap at this moment as to what becomes the next step of guidance. Now, it doesn't mean she's becoming the senior leader. And uh, she is stepping in to, 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 to begin to pull together and work with what needs to happen for the next phase. Now, I have to say we love Jenny. And, and Chris and I could not be more delighted because we trust Jenny. And I also know that Jenny's heart for this house is the same as our heart because I know when she came to study here in York and never left. And she stayed with us. Her heart was here and her heart's here. So, so Jenny gets the, the opportunity today just to talk to you in the last session. And, uh, and uh, we love you and bless you, Jenny, and I appreciate what you're doing. So things go on. The thing's moving forward. So let me just say a few things. I, I became a leader in this place at the ripe old age of 21. Back in those days, you used to get voted on to the leadership. Now, we got rid of all that nonsense. But I was 21, the ripe old age of 21, and, and I actually relished the responsibility that came with it. 
And uh, I have continued to give myself wholeheartedly to that purpose for the past 45 years. 38 of those years has been as a full-time employee. The key word there being employee. Because I and we have always been full-time, whether employed or not. And that can be part of the problem that has to be faced if anything is going to move ahead with momentum. Full-time must not be because you're paid to do a job. Full-time must be because you're committed fully in your heart to moving it forward. So, you know, I don't want to be critical, but I understand all the issues. Before we ever had that, we were full-time. And when I say full-time, I mean, back in those days, we were twice on a Sunday and a Sunday school. We were a Tuesday night for a Bible study. We were a Thursday night for a prayer meeting. We were a Saturday night for a fellowship meeting, and then because of where Chris and I were connected, we did kids work in Rickel on a Monday, and I did a house group in Weatherby on a Wednesday, and we went shopping on a Friday, because that was the only day that we had free. Now, I'm not wanting to bring back those days, and I think it was crazy, and I think we suffered, and our kids suffered. But what I do want you to understand is there has to be a full-time commitment to what you are committed to if you're going to make it be what you would like it to be. And so I'm very grateful that, um, you know, the church released me into ministry, made it so I didn't have to also be working in my regular job, as well as actually doing what we were doing while we had regular jobs. And I have appreciated that opportunity and the possibilities that that created for me. Now, if any of you are wondering about my life BC, before church, because you don't all know me, um, I actually turned down the offer of a very high-powered teaching role in the building industry with an ascendant career path that was already laid out and spelled out for me. Um, I, I turned away from that for what I believe was a higher calling. Now, I say that for two reasons. Number one, because I think sometimes look at you in ministry and can think, well, it's because you couldn't do anything else, so you stumbled into this gig. Um, I, I, I was on a career path that would have been very profitable, very helpful. I'd have probably been retired 11 years ago if I'd have followed that career path uh, and sitting pretty, but I'm glad I didn't. I'm very grateful. I don't regret my choice. And uh, for those that you don't know and, and, and don't maybe think about, some people call it fate, some people call it chance, some people call it happenstance. I always knew it as the will of God or the purpose of God or the call of God. Um, I, I came here by a miracle of grace. My father had been buried in two accidents in the coal mine and had to leave the coal mines from a big coal mining family. And... Um, and so my father finished up over here because the then pastor, a guy called Willie Roy, had told my father when he met him at a convention here that if he came to York, he would get him a job at Round Trees. He could get lots of jobs at Round Trees then. That was the go-to. And so my dad looked at it, and he came and stayed with a lady called Mrs. Dawson. But, uh, you know, we were from a coal mining family, lived in a pit house. Now, that doesn't mean the house was a pit, Right. That was a house owned by the coal mines, okay, that you rented like a council house. My dad had 25 pounds to his name, you know, because that was, that was just, we were coal miner, very working class. Uh, and so my dad didn't even know how he would or could or should move to the posh place, because this, this was posh to us. But he came over, and in a meeting one day, an old lady went to see the pastor and said, who's that young man? And so this pastor, Willie Roy, told her the story of how my father had had two accidents in the pit. He was leaving the pit, and Willie had said he would get him a job here if he moved to York, because there weren't many jobs where my dad was. This lady said, and, and I know the numbers of you in here would say, I wish that was me. This lady says, tell him I'll buy him a house, and he can pay me back whenever he can, whatever he can, and that's up to him. So that's literally what happened. This lady bought a house, was 33 pennies Grove Street, and we moved here, and my mum and dad were allowed just to pay that lady back 
whatever they could, when they could. No interest, nothing. And so you can imagine that changed not only the course of my mum and dad's life, and it not only became a blessing for me in the context of the ascendancy that that gave to them and the prosperity, but it also changed the course of my life because I finished up here. And if that incident hadn't have happened, I wouldn't have finished up here as a six-year-old boy, and therefore we wouldn't be having this conversation today as a 66-year-old man. So what I say there is that I came here by a miracle of grace, I believe, and I've stayed and I've made it to this day by that same miracle of grace of which the stories I could keep you here for much longer than the time that I have this morning. Now, I also want to say something else before I bring you to a particular point. Now, I have to say that there have been times in ministry where the pain has exceeded the pleasure. I think sometimes you look at this situation and you don't see that there's pain along with it. And there have been times where I have lived more hurt than I've lived happy. Now, I didn't say that's all the time, but you need to know those are the time. Now, now, I know this is not the bit you want to hear, and you probably think, Anth, why are you you saying this? Because I have to say it because sadly it's true, and I have a reason for saying it, which I'll tell you in a minute. And I also have to say that there have been times in ministry, because of that pain, where having reflected on my experience as as a church leader, I wonder if some people have aspirations to become a great magician. Because they have perfected the art of disappearing without trace. And that hurts. And it hurts the heart. And there's been a cost to this and a pain to this. I'm not saying that because I'm complaining. I'm saying because you need to know that that's a reality. And here's the reason I'm saying this. So I am asking of you for the future that you consider carefully what your choice and the way you enact that choice might do to the one who's leading you or the people who's leading you because they're people as well and they have a heart and they have feelings and they get pressure. So I'm asking you to consider that so there might be a kindness in that consideration. I'm not saying everybody has to be stuck and nobody can't make choices but please make them with integrity. Make them with consideration so that you actually look after and care for the people who are trying to care for you. Now, I'm not mad at you. It's okay. And I thank God that I've been robust enough to endure this because I know plenty of others who haven't. But like I said to you last week, I'm now tired and I don't think I want to do that for much more of my life. Now, watching the clip from Chicken Run, again, reminded me of something I said several weeks ago talking about curiosity. And that was this, Christianity without curiosity is like a bird with clipped wings. It is kept grounded and denied the freedom to fly to places unknown for fear it will never return to the place that it left. That's the curiosity. Now, I was gripped by one particular factor in the clip from Chicken Run, and it's the nature of the escape vessel. The thing that they pulled out of that split-open shed that was kind of nailed together, hammered together, glued together, screwed together, and made into the escape vehicle, I found really very interesting because it reminded me a little bit of what I think this probably looks like if you were to draw it. I was also caught by the fact that, that um, the, old, the old chicken who always talked about in my day and talked like an old RAF uh, veteran, the fact that he said, I'm behind you all the way. Listen, leaders don't need you to be behind you all the way. That can't be the mantra if this thing is to fly to the places it's supposed to. You have to embrace that today is your day. He said, you're always talking about in your day. You're always talking about behind you all the way. What you have to embrace is today is your day and people today is your day. 
attitude and application and step up, have the right attitude, the today's your day attitude, and that application and step up and step forward. And all that reminded me of something I read out years ago as a quote from a Brennan Manning book. And I'm not going to read all this, but just a quote from this, just to bring me through to where I want to be. And this is what I read. According to Wes Seeliger, in his book, Western Theology, there are two kinds of people, two visions of life. Now, this, when he's talking about Western theology, he's using something I grew up with. So I know if I were to read all this, it wouldn't make sense to some of you because you weren't raised on Westerns as movies. They were our predominant, our predominant movies growing up as kids in my era was Westerns, you know. So we understood about Western towns and mares and courthouses and, and, and white hats and black hats and all of that. So I know some of this would go way over some of your heads, but this won't, I hope. According to Wes Seeliger in his book, Western Theology, there are two kinds of people, two visions of life, the settler and the pioneer. The first sees life as a possession which must be secure and guarded. The second sees life as a wild, fantastic gift. The first sees life as a problem to be solved. The second sees life as a potential to be realized. These two types give rise to two kinds of theology. Settler theology attempts to answer all the questions, define and housebreak some sort of supreme being, establish the status quo on golden tablets in cinemascope, and ensure certainty is served up in huge doses. Pioneer theology attempts to understand this strange gift called life, understands that the most accurate theology is the one that accepts it may not be accurate. That sees God not as a noun to be defined, but as a verb to be lived, allowing its adherents to live fully and love wastefully. The wild, wild west is the setting for both these theologies. In settler theology, the church convenes at the courthouse. The courthouse is the symbol of law, order, stability, security, identity and safety, salvation and judgment. But it does have a weekly ice cream party within its walls. That to me is what the church generally has become. In pioneer theology, and this is what I want you to catch. In pioneer theology, the church doesn't convene, the church moves in a covered wagon. Think of the old western covered wagons. It's a house on wheels, always on the move. The covered wagon is where the pioneers eat, sleep, fight, love, live and die. It bears the marks of life and movement. It creaks. It's scarred with arrows and bandaged with baling wire. The covered wagon is where the action is. It moves towards the future, trying not to get bogged down in old ruts. The old wagon isn't comfortable, but the pioneers don't seem to mind. Comfort was never their objective. They are more interested in where they're going than where they've been. They're on a quest. In settler theology, sin is breaking one of the town's ordinances breaking the rules. In pioneer theology, sin is wanting to turn back. And so I want to read to you what I read last week, seen as I peaked then. <laughs> because I think there's nothing greater that I could leave you with when we talked about Anthony Gaudi and the building of the La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. This is what I read to you. There is no reason to regret that I cannot finish the church. I will grow old, but others will come after me. What must always be considered is the spirit of the work. But its life has to depend on the generations it is handed down to and with whom it lives and is incarnated. That, my friends, from today, is you. Good morning. 
<laughs> I've actually got written on my notes in bold. It's morning. So that's my first challenge. Um, I'm going to echo what Danny said um, because it's been um, on my mind too. Isaac Newton said, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. And I have had giants who have stood on their shoulders for many, many years now. But I have never seen so far in the whole of my life. Um, but I also have this absolute sense that there is yet further to see, which is incredible. And there will be a shift in who shoulders the weight. That's what happens when people change roles on a very practical level. Other people have to shoulder weight, and that is not insignificant when you've had giants. So some people are willing to do that. I am willing to do that. And it may be as you're sitting there, and if you've listened tonight, you think, I want to shoulder some weight. Um, and you are quite welcome to volunteer. And so it is a beginning. We do not know yet what form it will take. We do not know yet. Uh, there's not like this big rush of, woo! Um, we genuinely don't know because that's appropriate for the beginning of something, not to know what's going to happen further down the ra road, but to have a direction. And Ant said last week, he said, it is a bend in the road, not an end to the road. And if you are a driver, or even if you're a, in a car with a as a passenger at any point, you don't want to go careering into a bend. You don't accelerate towards it. You don't decide to do anything clever. When you're navigating a bend in the road, you shift gear, you slow down a little, you consider, you think, you're wise, and that is what we are going to do. We're going to navigate the bend really, really brilliantly. And so when we, we had the challenge of what does Q mean to us, which was the question we were all asked, because what does it mean to us? What does it mean to you as you sit here today? Um, I started thinking what Q went, um, meant to me and the four things that I had to hang my hat on as saying, well, if I wanted a direction for Q and to work with people on that direction, what would be my four things? So I'm going to share them with you because it might resonate for you too. And the first one for me is that we ask questions because we remain curious. We are not going to lose our curiosity because it took some of us a really long time to know that we could ask questions. We didn't know I could. So we are going to remain curious to ask questions. The second thing is that we each commit to our own growth. Um, so much of the time it's easy to say, well, they should do that and they should just change that. If you are someone who is growing, you have phenomenal compassion for other people who are growing. So if you want to help grow people, be someone who's growing. And this is a great place to plant yourself if you want to grow. The third thing is we are going to commit to help one another grow and have an investment behind that. And the fourth one is that we are not going to let the, the dogma back in. Um, those dogmatic beliefs that says, we have to think this, we have to believe that, we all have to see the world in this way, because that's the fence, that's what puts us back in the prison. And so all of those things, if you're someone who wants to stay curious, grow yourself, grow others, and not get back behind a fence, then that's the direction of travel as we work out what's next in the bend. Um, I remembered a, um, a book by, it's a book called uh, the Falling Upwards by Richard Raw, and in it he talks about the two halves of life. It's not to do with age, it's actually to do with that different spirit Anth talked about. And he said that sin happens when we refuse to keep growing. And similar to your pioneer definition, that was refusing to keep going. So we're going to keep going, and we're going to keep growing. But he also says um, this. He says, the first half of life is spent building our sense of identity, importance, and security. But in the second half of life, we do not have strong and final opinions about everything, every event, or most people, as much as we allow things and people to delight us sadden us and truly influence us and you've brought us to the second half of life so we are going to live in the second half of life we're going to keep going um, and I think that's really exciting and I know that um, Team Q we have got a good shot at this so is today a sad day or is it a hopeful day well of course we're a little bit sad because uh, we we like you, and we liked what you did in the role that you played in our life. But I choose today great hope. Hope because I 
uh, believe we have an absolutely excellent, excellent quest, and I hope everyone here chooses to join it for what's next. So we're going to end with the final song, but as I get down from the stage, I know you don't want to speak, so I promise you I'm not going to do that, but I do think we should give you an absolutely massive round of applause as an incredible thank you for everything you've done and the weight you've borne. We really appreciate it. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank